Thanks, Georg. Uh, I'm assuming people can see my screen and hear my voice. Uh, if you can't, you'll just have to interrupt me. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell the story that I came prepared to share here today. I'm going to talk about a particular inner source project, very active, very important inner source project, and uh, some of the challenges and opportunities that we found as we've managed this, this critical piece of infrastructure in an inner source uh, fashion. So this is my story of running an inner source project, continuously deployed in production uh, five times, and you'll see a little bit about what that means as we go along. Uh, first of all, just an introduction of myself. Uh, I'm Russ Rutledge. I'm the director of InterSource at WellSky. WellSky is a technology company in the healthcare industry. And let me tell you a little bit about the background of this particular InterSource project and how it was built, how it was, how it came to be. Uh, this uh, particular uh, project is an internal tool. It was created by one business area, and uh, it's a tool that generates UI that runs in production that our clients uh, see. So it's something that our, our end users end up touching, and it's run as an inner source project. This particular tool was uh, very, very useful. It was identified as a, a key part of WellSky's technology stack by our senior leadership, and they wanted it shared widely throughout the company. So to take it from the one business area that developed it, and to push it out among all of WellSky's business areas. Okay. Uh, and part of the strategy for doing this was InterSource. Uh, at the same time that every business unit was expected to adopt this tool, it was made clear from the beginning that any updates would come in uh, from the business unit that needs it via InterSource contributions. Uh, so we got to the point where uh, five separate business areas from WellSky have onboarded uh, to this tool. And let me show you what that looks like. Uh, this uh, tool is, runs in a, a GitHub uh, repository. Uh, there's a main branch and the original uh, team that developed it had a uh, release process with their release branch uh, out to their production environment uh, for that particular business unit. Uh, when this inner source project was being rolled out and onboarded to, it was something that was overseen by our senior management, making sure that different business units onboarded uh, for a while in our uh, company technical executive meetings, there'd be updates on each business unit and their onboarding status to this project. Uh, so when, when rubber meets the road and it hits the ground, you know, what do you do when you're supposed to start using uh, a new product or a new tool? Uh, the common thing is to look at what others have done and copy it and, and make it work uh, for you. And that's just what happened with the deployment and release process. We had team two come around and copy what team one was doing out to production and so on and so forth until uh, all five business units have their own release branch and their own release and production process. Uh, everyone bought on to the idea of inner source and we had contributions coming from all over the place. Anytime a, a one of these teams or business units needed new functionality, we had team one contributing and team two and team three and team five and team one again and team four. Uh, we actually tracked metrics over this over the last uh, six months and we have averaged about one uh, pull request every single business day uh, for the six months that we've been tracking. So it's an extremely active inner source uh, project. And uh, which was great to see. I was really excited to, uh, to see that when I joined the project and starting at the company. Now, uh, over time, uh, we noticed that all of these contributions tended to be skewed toward one type of contributions, which is new features, new functionality needed by the teams as they went out for production. And this continual investment of new feature work, it, eventually the infrastructure and underlying technology stack begin to lag and sag and not be able to support uh, well all of these additional features. As teams and representatives from these business units got together, we all realized that additional investment was needed in the project infrastructure, uh, making the build fast, having a reliable and fast test suite, setting up production monitoring, a standardized deployment uh, process. All of these things that are part of a well run software project but never tended to be the next inner source contribution that a business unit was ready to make. We remedied this situation by adopting one of the patterns in the inner source patterns handbook, the core team pattern. Uh, we formed a team of full-time uh, engineers whose job it was to take care of these infrastructure type items 
so that the project remain easy to onboard and to contribute to. And this uh, picture that I've lifted from the Patterns Handbook shows a visual of this. The core team is tasked with ensuring that the underlying infrastructure is a solid platform that intersource contributions can build on. Things like modularity, versioning, continuous deployment process, automated testing, production monitoring, like I talked about earlier, form a solid base so that uh, feature contributions from our business unit have a, a solid and a stable place to land and stand. And this helped us quite a bit in having the right balance of work done in the project with this infrastructure and platform work, uh, balancing out the many, many feature contributions that came in almost daily. Even with this balance uh, over the, the ensuing months, uh, we noticed that just in the features and functionality that came in, there were breaks uh, that came in with so many inner source contributions. We would have functionality contributed that works well for one of our business units, but ends up breaking another. And sometimes it was small things that had a big effect. Uh, I still remember when a team checked in a change where the overall theme for the project changed from blue to orange. And this seems like a small thing and the team uh, you know, team number two that wanted blue, they were very happy with it. But team number five, whose customers were used to seeing the orange theme, it was a big deal. And we had uh, several conversations about how to fix that and then what to do to adjust the way we work so breaks like that don't happen again. Uh, besides actual breaks like this, another break in process was there were multiple times where because contribution happens so frequently, teams began to develop uh, the same or very similar functionality. So even though we were all working on an inner source project, we still had duplicated work. <laughs> and we'd find out that teams were working on the same feature and we wouldn't notice until it was too late and uh, code was ready for pull requests or one team had gotten in their functionality and merged first and it completely broke you know, what the other team was trying to do. And it took a lot to disentangle that. And so our approach that we're still on right now, since we have a smaller number of, of business units, we just have those half dozen, uh, is to form personal relationships with each of the contributing business units. I've talked about us having a core team of engineers to take care and coordinate those underlying infrastructure concerns of the project. That team is also staffed with a product owner like a regular scrum team. And this product owner, part of their responsibility is to interface with the product people on a regular basis from each of those five other business units to ensure that we're all aligned uh, on the upcoming changes that are happening in the product to make sure that there's no surprises that come in or if our kind of core product person hears of similar functionality being planned or on the roadmap, uh, we can have the conversation up front rather than waiting till implementation to realize that we're working on the same thing. To try to scale this, uh, these personal connections, We've also set up regular review councils. Uh, these uh, councils are for any significant new feature updates uh, in the inner source project, uh, where the team that's planning on introducing new functionality comes and reviews it uh, with the core team and also with representatives from all the onboarded business units. Uh, it may be similar to a sort of RFC process that I've heard talked about in other inner and open source projects. This uh, council has two parts to it. One is a product or solutions focused council where we review from a user perspective, what is the change that's coming? There'll be a textual description of what updates are gonna be made to the product. What's the business case that's motivating it? Screenshots of what the UI will look like when the feature work is done. It's a product focused review. And the goal here is to stave off the two things that we saw earlier to make sure that new features and functionality uh, are aware you know, to all the business units and also that there's feedback so that what comes will work for everyone. Uh, we can also avoid duplication uh, of work. If another business unit attends the review and sees that business unit number one is working on this functionality, they know to work together uh, rather than uh, working separately. And we've had cases where uh, two business units were planning similar functionality and they uh, both end up merging their plans and each of them create half of, of what's needed. So they work together in that way. And a lot of that comes out uh, first in these product focus reviews. Uh, after this product review and sign off, 
There's also an engineering uh, review council that's attended by the team planning on contributing the engineering work, as well as a representative from all the contributing teams and our core team. And the purpose of this is to take the features that the product folks agreed on and then to agree as engineers how we're going to implement them. Uh, what APIs should change? What should be the schema of the data when it's stored? Uh, should we implement some of this functionality ourselves or bring in an open source project to do it for us? All of those engineering design decisions, big decisions, are discussed in the review uh, for how a particular feature is going to be implemented. The goal here is that we end up with a holistic architecture. We avoid spaghetti code or spaghetti architecture. And we could do this just by reviewing code that comes in pull requests, but would have much less visibility. And there's also a much higher uh, cost to giving this type of feedback and pull request. Uh, we could get to a pull request and the feedback could be, you've implemented this feature completely wrong. You should have implemented it in this other API here rather than uh, you know, in this uh, database procedure where you've gone, gone and done it. You need to go and redo this work. Uh, that type of feedback doesn't help any. any. We want to catch those major points of feedback up front. So we do it in this engineering review council and that helps us avoid wasted work. Uh, this product and engineering review councils takes us uh, from the situation we're in where uh, uh, contributions are coming from all over every single day and creates a, a standard path uh, whereby all features can come in in an understood way as inner source contributions. And that's gotten us a long way and uncovered the next point of maturity in our inner source process which is we have ways of aligning from a product perspective what's happening with this project from an engineering perspective. The next thing we're finding is the need to align from a QA or a test process. I talked about each team having parallel uh, uh, mechanisms for releasing this inner source project to production. And that comes with their existing QA process from team one, team two, all the way down to team five or team N. And since the release process is uh, separate and they're separate production environments, uh, the natural thing that happened uh, without any prior planning was for the QA or test processes to be, to be separate. Uh, it's great because each team takes ownership of making sure that this Interforce project works for them, but it's difficult because we'll get all the way to the right on this uh, graphic and team two has feedback that a feature developed by team one ends up breaking something about the way uh, team two's usage patterns. This feedback comes very late and we have to go all the way back to the beginning and start a check in to the main branch again. Uh, what we're in the process of now is uh, shifting left our QA and test process, just like we've shifted left our product and engineering uh, reviews through the councils I talked about earlier. Our vision and what we'd like to do is to have a robust inner source activity around our testing and test cases, just like we do with our source code. We want to shift, uh, shift left as much as we can, the automated tests that each QA team is running after the fact and shift those so that they run and pass before new code gets into the main, into the main branch. Uh, that should give feedback much faster. And it's really something that our inner source contributors have been asking for. Uh, we'll have the QA lead from a particular team uh, ask us as the core team. Uh, they'll say something like, this other feature uh, that team one is developing looks great. How do I make sure that as I develop it, as they develop it, it meets our use cases or it doesn't break anything that we depend on? Uh, uh, up until now, we've had to have conversations to communicate that. But what we want to move to is that's communicated in test cases. Team two should have automated test cases that describe what they need out of this piece of functionality and what they want to make sure doesn't break. And the answer is if the test case is run and pass, we have confidence that it'll work for team two. Uh, we see it on the other side as well. Contributors at WellSky are gracious and wanna make sure that they don't break any other teams. We've had the team developing a feature, team four developing a feature might say to us, how do I make sure that as I develop this, I don't break anyone else. I know how to test my own product, but I wanna make sure that these changes don't break for anyone else. And the answer that uh, we want to be able to give and what we're moving to is, uh, don't worry, all the other teams have codified their test cases that are important to them. When the test suite runs and pass, you can be confident that your changes uh, are solid. So we'll have inner source contribution of test cases and QA process in addition to inner source contribution of the source code. 
Well, I'll stop there. This is an outline of some of the challenges uh, and uh, that we've had, uh, successes that we've seen and what we're doing about them. There's more material that I've shared on this topic that I want to reference. Uh, to start with at the top, uh, on my personal YouTube channel, I have a video about 15 minutes called Inner Source Responsibilities that outlines a lot more detail how our product and engineering councils work. Uh, there's a flowchart di diagram about how we run that process as well as responsibilities uh, on a time basis and what responsibilities in those councils come from the contributing team versus the host team. Uh, I also speak in a lot more detail about our strategy of forming a core team. Uh, I gave that at the Intersource Summit last year, uh, uh, talking about the motivations and how we've set up the team and judge and enable its success. So in a sense, this talk today is kind of part two of the journey that I began to share last year with that talk specifically on a core team. With that, thanks so much. I'm glad to come here and share the story and to uh, talk with you and learn more together about Intersource. Thank you.